Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for choosing the science lecture today. Um, so today is a special day, an important day. Um, today is April 24. It's the 103rd commemorative year of the Armenian Genocide, uh, where we remember our victims and continue to fight for recognition and uh, acknowledgement and continued human rights fight for all of the genocides that have occurred. Um, but as an Armenian and as a science lecture coordinator, I wasn't sure, should I cancel today? Are people gonna come today? Many people are not here because they're participating in various commemorative events in the city, around the city. Um, but then I thought to myself, I'm not gonna cancel. I'm sure some people will show up. And then I thought, who should I ask to come speak? Or what should we even talk about? So then I started thinking, post-genocide, people have actually been very creative and have created things out of struggle. They've actually survived and made it and then done something productive with their lives. So I was thinking, what else can we talk about? So then I contacted, I knew exactly who was gonna do it because I knew she was gonna be great. So I contacted my friend and colleague, Ozzy, and asked, hey, would you possibly consider speaking about something like that? Um, and yeah, she said yeah, so she's here. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a short biography of our speaker. And we have a few surprises for our speaker and then we'll give the floor to her. Um, Ozzy Mkhitaryan is a professor of political science at East Los Angeles College and a former professor of communications at Woodbury University where she taught undergraduate courses in communications and graduate courses in politics, media, and social justice. Her primary areas of research are American government with an emphasis on the role of women in history and international relations with an emphasis on women's rights in the developing world. Currently, she is researching the correlation between equality and violence during government transitions. Prior to joining the academic community, Ozzy was a journalist who covered current affairs, entertainment, and world news. So this is just a really short biography of what Ozzy has accomplished, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea. So before I give the floor to Ozzy, we have a few guests here. Uh, first, we're going to start with Vickery Murphy. She is a representative from Senator Portentino's office. She's going to present a recognition certificate. So, Ozzy, if you could come forward a more. What? Yeah. Put you in the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. She'll present. So we have this certificate of recognition from Senator Portentino to thank you for being here today. And it says, on behalf of the California State Senate, I join Glendale Community College in thanking you for participating in the science lecture series to discuss how atrocities affect intellectual cap capital in science and culture. On this day of remembrance, I commend you for your contributions to our understanding of the disruption of genocide and resulting efforts to survive and innovate. Best wishes on all your future endeavors. Wow, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you very much. thank you so much. And one more, of course. We also have Blake Dillinger from Assemblymember Laura Friedman. Hi. Hi. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this special on this wow. day and this subject matter. I mean, thank it's you like, for acknowledging. you know, part of the day is, of course, still fighting to make this a fact. But then it's also important that we learn the facts and really what the repercussions were. And I think the Armenian community is the best example of what you can do with one of the worst things that's ever happened to any people in the human race. So, you know, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for carrying that torch. And uh, we really appreciate you spending your time on this day for that. So thank you. Thank you for the acknowledgement. I really appreciate it. I'm surprised and appreciate yes. the acknowledgement. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mara. Yes. Well, thank you so much. So right, then I one, can go now. One more thing. Bye. We're not done yet. <laughs> so well, our, So I really am thankful that you're here because today is a day that you could have been doing something else to commemorate. There's so many events on campus or in the city. But also our science lecture is, um, uh, there's, a donate, there's a donor, uh, William Golke, who gives an honorarium payment to honor the speakers that come and speak and provide their knowledge. So we do have an honorarium payment. Um, and it might be a little bit odd on genocide day to get a payment, but it's not a payment. It's really an appreciation for you coming and sharing your knowledge. So that's yours too. And 
you could continue. Wow, okay. okay. So the floor is all yours. Okay, well, now that I'm off my game, <laughs> let's begin. Uh, well, thank you very much. First of all, I had no what idea at all. You're a very, very quiet secret of human. Um, okay, so uh, first, obviously, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging what today is for a lot of people here in, in the community. Today is the Genocide Commemoration Day, the 103rd um, anniversary of those atrocities, and a day to, to try to um, assert the history again. Um, Having said that, I also want to acknowledge the great, great um, success of the people's movement in Armenia this last um, couple of days. This was a huge historic moment for the people's revolution. There are people's revolutions happening everywhere. This was a huge victory. There's lots of emotion, lots of excitement, lots of, of, of um, anxiety as to what is to come, but it's a huge victory for, for, for people's movements everywhere. Um, and I'd like to take one quick moment to acknowledge that currently right now there is also people's movement happening in Nicaragua and there have been numerous, numerous uh, youth and journalists slaughtered on the streets and their movement is not yet uh, successful, has not um, led yet to fruitful results. It was about cutting social security. The government has rescinded that, but um, it has not paid for the crimes of slaughtering youth in the street. So there are people's movements today all over the world. Um, yesterday, this last couple of days, this win in, in Armenia is just an example of what happens when the people get together and work against greed and corruption and, and the way power and resources are distributed. And it's a huge win for people's movements everywhere. So let's start with that. Yes. Can you explain to, to the audience what happened as a result of people's movements? Well, there are a lot of people's movements in all of the world right now. So Armenia is a good example because it just happened and it's exciting and it's relevant to a lot of uh, uh, people around the world and especially to the Armenian diaspora. The people's movement was about unseating a prime minister who had been in power for 10 years as a president. Uh, we just turned into a parliamentary system in Armenia and he had said he wasn't going to take the position of the prime minister but nonetheless took the position of prime minister and we had a, a people's movement that started very peacefully and started as a walk. One of the um, PMs started walking from region to region protesting this power grab and others joined and it was an example of, of, of powerful human capital. And a lot of us that study this field, I study political science and teach it, a lot of us get really, uh, in some ways, jaded where people's movements and revolutions always the outcome is bloodshed and then there's a reassertion of greed and power. So for people like me, this was a very um, empowering movement to watch this sort of transition. And for a lot of us who are done, where revolutions are causing only bloodshed everywhere and no real substantial change, a lot of us had sort of checked out of the space of true substantial change and we're just teaching it and discussing it as observers. And to me, this has emboldened and empowered that space. And I hope that other people's movements around the world, like in Nicaragua, um, get some results as well for their people. So are there any questions about the people's movement? If you're interested, it, well, it's all over the news and all over Facebook, and some of you, I'm sure, um, have been following it. Okay, so uh, when I was asked to, <clears throat> to speak about the genocide, I, I initially wanted to say, uh, I don't do that. Um, I don't generally speak about the genocide. I don't, this is not my area of scholarship, nor my area of expertise. Um, I am a, a granddaughter of a genocide orphan. Uh, I do see very clearly this transgenerational trauma in my dad all the time as he ages. I, I, it comes from him in a form that is a silent form. He never goes to these commemorative marches, never puts the Armenian flag on his car and drives around, never really talks about any of it. And so his truth and his sort of uh, trauma is sort of silent and I guess in some ways I've without thinking about it modeled that space as well because when I went to, to study, study this field I veered away from genocide studies. I don't usually, I, I get asked to speak at a lot of um, events and I don't ever take events that have to do with genocide um, issues. So myself I guess I've modeled that behavior and sort of veered away. Um, when I was told this is sort of a science lecture I thought well let me think about how I can 
use this space and, and, th and think differently about genocide lectures. And I thought, what, what is it that we can look forward to? And often something that we've seen, it seems to be a pattern, something that we've seen is post-genocide, post-disruption, post-casualties, post-trauma, um, if there's ever such a thing as real post-trauma, there happens to be, it seems to be an accelerated development of innovation and in, in many fields, in science, in technology, in literature, and art. And I was think I wanted to sort of explore what was it that spurred this development or what looks like accelerated development? What might be the thing that causes this? And in a lot of uh, cultures and a lot of um, uh, groups that have suffered genocide and atrocities, you can see this sort of accelerated development, accelerated wanting to contribute in some way or catch up in some way. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to explore that for this lecture. So this is a work in progress, which I am excited about opening up to sort of to you and to get ideas, because as I was building this um, about a, a week ago, my entire thesis fell apart. Everything I thought was true in those patterns was not. So we're going to explore it together. So we all know. We all know what happens with genocide. We know the basic uh, trajectory of, of genocide and war and atrocities. We know that uh, initially the intellectuals will, will be rounded up, the thinkers, the, the makers, the shakers of culture and ideas of that particular group will be rounded up and, and silenced, dislocated, or slaughtered. That is the first move that happens, sort of the makers of culture, the keepers of culture. And then uh, very quickly after that, the men and young boys will be taken, dislocated or slaughtered. And then women um, suffer genocide in a very different way, oftentimes through rape, uh, through slavery, through forced assimilation, through childbearing. Um, so they suffer, there's like gendered studies on genocide, which is very interesting. And so we know what happens as a whole, as a trauma, as, a, as violence. We know that there is a complete disruption in the flow of progress because it must be because then what is left after that is only to try to survive. So if you're in survival mode, there is a disruption, right? To that flow of progress, to innovation, to moving forward as a culture, as a people, as humans. There is a stop in that space. But something very interesting happens that doesn't really stop. Progress goes underground or disperses. And just like they say life will always sort of find a way, progress and innovation always seems to find a way, or often seems to find a way. So it'll either go underground or it'll disperse. And in the best case scenarios, it will flourish in the country itself under a new government regime. So this is the space that I, I kind of want to explore with you guys. What is it, what is that seed that allows for for this kind of destruction, this kind of inhumanity to take place amongst a group, but yet progress is not ever silenced. It might be stifled a bit, but it continues. It moves forward. Uh, people's work, their creativity, and their need to, to add something to humanity keeps moving forward regardless of genocide, regardless of atrocity. So this is what I'd like to explore today together. So let's look through what we're, what we're talking about. So, um, clearly, we said there is a disruption in the continuum of progress, right? A disruption in, in the sharing of knowledge, the disruption in whatever was being built at the moment. There is clear socio-cultural socio distress, oftentimes in this sort of space. Um, in this sort of space, in order for genocide to occur, there has to be a dehumanization of a people or a group. It's one of the markers that you can see when genocide or mass atrocities are coming, this sort of beginning of dehumanization, um, taking away from the value of that group, of that ethnic group, of that culture, or whatever it happens to be, that religious group, taking away from their humanity uh, systematically. This is a, process, a pattern that we see completely, creating the sense that they're vermin in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, they're parasites, sucking away from the host culture's um, potential of being uh, great, of being sort of the mythological, legendary past that they once were, reassessing, recreating that space. So there is this devaluing, this dehumanizing of the person, of the people, of the culture, this taking away from their value of humans. Um, 
once this has happened, I think this is sort of tied to accelerated, uh, accelerated innovation. Once this, is, this has happened, this flow of progress is stopped, the dehumanization is so complete and so full that it's easy to go around and slaughter children um, because you've dehumanized them so much, the culture itself has to sort of re, um, a self, reassess its self-perception, their own value, because their value has tried to be eradicated. Their value as humans, their value is what they can contribute to society. Their value as scientists, their value as thinkers, as artists, as, as writers, their value, period. And what are we as humans? One of the things we're always trying to do is assert our value. What are we here for on this planet? What are we doing? How are we contributing? And so when that value is taken away of the entire group of an entire culture, that has to be somehow reasserted. It has to to be held onto or you crumble. And I think this is sort of the direction I'm leaning to. Once this recalibration is sort of done, once people either take uh, progress underground, disperse it to various other countries through the diaspora, through host countries, or have a recalibration of the entire governmental system and are allowed to flourish under their government, once those things are happened, there is this need to reassert their humanness, their humanity, and their value to the world. What value do you have? What do you offer as a culture? Who are you? When your entire culture, your entire identity as a person has been diminished, taken away, you have no value, you're worth nothing. Your children are worth nothing. Your language is worth nothing. Your religion is worth nothing. You have no value on earth. There is a fervor in order to still exist. There is a fervor to reassert your value. And I think it is this reassertion of our human value that spurs um, accelerated innovation in some uh, genocide survivors. So there are variations in the acceleration of the scientific, technological, or, or intellectual progress. Uh, some groups uh, accelerate very quickly, and you can, you can count the numbers and the, the, the speed with which their survivors are trying to contribute, are trying to do something, are trying to reassert their value as humans. And in some places, um, that is a little slower. In some groups, that is not as quick to happen. And so I was trying to figure out, like, what is the variation? Why is it in some groups that, that, that suffer genocide or mass atrocity, suffer dehumanization as a whole, when they recalibrate culturally who they are, they move forward and try to contribute to, they move forward and try to contribute and reassert their value as humans. What is my value as a human? What do I contribute to the world? And what is the difference between other groups that do not? Are there, are there factors that we can point to that we can say this particular group in this particular circumstance might be able to contribute faster, have accelerate, accelerated progress post-genocide, and this particular group not. What might be? Why? And so this is where I started this, this sort of journey of trying to figure out this space. Um, and I decided that we'd look at, or I'd look at, um, well, we're not going to go in detail of all of these um, spaces and, and genocides and civil wars, but Armenian genocide, 1915, Cambodia uh, through 75 and 79, Bosnia, 92 through 95, and Rwanda, 94. And we're going to look at these sort of spaces and, and talk about not necessarily what happened in those spaces, because what happened is more or less the same. Um, mass atrocities, uh, the shredding of the fabric of society, the, de like the complete destruction of the, of the infrastructure of that society. Like for example, in Rwanda, in three months, 800,000 people were massacred. In three months, that fabric of that society completely ruptured. Uh, millions of people were displaced. We're talking a very short period of time. Um, Bosnia is still not done sort of accepting the reality of their genocide. You can still go to certain areas of Bosnia and see the buildings where they shot up and killed thousands of young men and, and boys. And you can walk around to the older neighbors and say, hey, what happened here? And they say, I don't know. I don't know. Nothing. What? No, nothing happened. I don't know. Yeah, tourists come and look, but no. I don't know what they're looking at. So they're not done yet even reconciling the reality of, of their very recent past. Cambodia. Um, not only did it suffer mass genocide through that period, but for 20 years after it had the Khmer Rouge, the same sort of regime, uh, 
indoctrinating and dictating life in Cambodia. In Armenia, and of course, you know, it's Western Armenia, uh, which was modern day Turkey at the time, most dispersed around uh, the world. Some uh, survivors contributed greatly to the world. A lot perished, a million have perished, but Armenia itself never as a country completely re reconciled that space either because it was going through its own transformation as a country. First Soviet, then independent, then Soviet, then independent, and today brand new again. We'll see which direction we'll go today in Armenia. But as a people, the Armenians have very uh, clearly reconciled their past and have uh, understood their past and would like to express their past and reassert who they are as humans and their value um, in the world. So, uh, and as the Rwandans too, very clearly. Uh, now, when looking at this list, this space, uh, could you sort of come up with why some of them accelerated in their contributions to the world, scientifically, culturally, uh, artistically, literally, and why um, others may not have? Because my, my assessments were absolutely wrong. If you look at these spaces, why would you think some might have, um, have accelerated development scientifically, culturally, technologically, and others may not have? Some may have had populations that were more easily um, moved into other locations that had diasporas that were larger. That moved out a lot stronger in larger diasporas? That's a good way to look at it. I think that there is some logic to that. It's cultural values. Society, the culture of that country values, let's say, music, mm -hmm. art, then they would. Does that, those are the directions I was leaning to, I'd have to say, both of yours. I have one other direction I was leaning to, and it came out to be wrong. So as I was working on this presentation, my, my, I was wrong. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you how I was wrong. But I had the same sort of ideas. What other space might you look at and say, like, OK, this might be where you can see this group uh, excelling more rapidly, contributing more rapidly, reasserting. Now remember, our entire struggle, really, we cannot escape this. Our entire struggle as humans is to sort of assert our identity. Who are we? What are we? Why are we here? What are we doing? Um, all of our struggles around the world are struggles of identity our Armenianness, our language, our um, Rwandanness, our, our religion in Bosnia, Cambodia, our, sort of our struggle of who we are, their identity issues, always. So post-genocide, po trauma never leaves, I guess, but post-genocide, who are we is reasserted. In some cases, it's reasserted very loud. In other cases, it's muted. And this is, I'm not saying some had different cultural values. Obviously, those variations existed. But these this four don't go down that line of those variations. My assess, my idea was, I thought, maybe more agrarian cultures um, excel at a slower rate, agrarian uh, kind of groups excel at a slower rate, and mercantile groups excel at a faster rate because they're, that was my assessment. So when I started, I started with that idea. Okay, this is great, I'll look here, and I'll go with that, and I'll prove my thesis. I was wrong. So Armenians at the time, Armenians seemed to have uh, looked towards uh, the West more easily, had sort of uh, education in the West, post-genocide, and we'll go, go through a few of them, um, they accelerated their uh, contribution to the world, both technologically, scientifically, literally, artistically, very rapidly. Um, their view might have been more towards the, the West. A lot of them ended up um, in, in countries that had strong infrastructure for development. There are more mercantile people, so there is rapid development in that area. Cambodians are an agrarian culture. Um, Post-genocide, they did not develop um, rapidly. There's not much contribution to the world as there are in comparison to some of the other uh, genocide uh, groups that I was studying. Their contribution to the world in terms of scientific technology, uh, uh, science technology, even infrastructure in their own country is lacking tremendously. Uh, they're not moving forward as, as quickly. Bosnia, very little. A very small space of forward movement. Um, and Bosnia was mercantile as well. They were not as agrarian as Cambodia. And then we have Rwanda, which is an agrarian culture moved forward very rapidly. In fact, Rwanda is doing probably as an example of, of 
post-genocide recovery if there's ever one. They're moving to get very quickly. Their scientific technological advances are great as a nation, as a country, and as a people. And they're, they're agrarian. So my entire thesis sort of fell apart here. So now let's explore and see why. I don't have the answer as to why. I have some assessments as to why. So maybe we can explore that together as to why. I'm going to go through um, some uh, examples of Armenians that have contributed. And then we're going to go talk a little bit about Rwanda and um, how they're looking and what they're doing and why it seems to be working in their, in their, um, in their country. And then Cambodia and Bosnia very uh, slightly. I do have to say, though, I, I did when I was when I was studying this, I did have to take a step back and think, what are the metrics for success? Like, what are you measuring for success? What are we deciding as what progress is? Am I looking at it through a very Western lens? And is that why I can't see it in Cambodia? I can't measure it because I'm seeing it from the lens that I only know how to see it from. And so we do have to come up with some sort of agreement as to what progress is. But um, outside of that lens, I do have to say that perhaps progress in Cambodia was something else. Um, Post-genocide, their birth rate um, shot up um, and continued to shoot up. So maybe their idea, once they absolutely demolished anybody who had any education at all in Cambodia, nobody really survived. They had a strong diaspora community, but I don't know if the educated class got out. I think they were disseminated completely. So. Um, they did have a strong diaspora, but I don't know. I think the agrarian culture was able to leave. I think the intellectual culture was really decimated, completely decimated. So, um, so maybe their idea of success is a little different. Maybe they progressed very differently. Maybe it was like, okay, post all of this, I get a farm and I get to have more kids because my kids were slaughtered and this is my form of, of, progr of progress. But in the greater scale of like, looking at progress from the Western's perspective, from the lens that we're looking at it today, they don't even have um, a strong uh, infrastructure for communication technology right now. They have some initiatives coming up for development, but they are very, very behind most other countries in Cambodia. So they have not recovered. Bosnia is not even close to recovering from, from their trauma. From their us. All right, let's look at Armenians. So um, Armenians were looking already towards the West at the time. A lot of the Armenians in Constantinople were already Western educated. A lot of them had uh, this ideas of success and progress that were very sort of Western and European already as it was. Um, of course, intellectuals did get rounded up, but many also did escape. Um, and many were born on the route, on route to escaping. So this space, there was a lot who's, who were able to get out. Once they did get out, there was this fervor of trying to uh, develop, trying to innovate, trying to contribute, trying to reassert their humanity and their value. And I think this is something that we can all understand, this notion of you being devalued as a human. How do you reclaim your value? If I were to ask you, and this is hard for us to even see or understand, we can empathize, but if I were to ask you, what is your value as a human? It's a very hard thing to say, oh, I do this, or I do that, I am this, this is my title, this is what I give. But when that value, however, whatever you hold on to, give yourself value, whatever you hold on to has been completely demolished, um, how do you regain that value? And I think one of the things that Armenians needed to do was to prove that value again. And, and you see it today. You see it in the kids of, of people who are, um, who are out there marching, wearing T-shirts, or saying the Turks failed or the Ottoman Empire failed. Um, they still speak Armenian. They still raise their kids with this understanding of Armenian history. They're still fighting for recognition of some countries for um, the Armenian genocide. So for, for them, that sort of stance of we're still here, we have value, seemed to be very important even from the very beginning so contribution was very accelerated they did however go to west a lot of them did end up in western countries like europe united states canada that had the infrastructure there ready for development that was already moving forward 1920s the united states was moving forward it's a very innovative space very open to ideas it had that infrastructure in a lot of these uh, young people who ended up we're only going to talk about four of them very quickly who ended up in that part of the, in this part of the world um, fell 
into that infrastructure, fell into a culture that had characteristics that were already moving forward. They adopted a lot of those characteristics. They became more diverse and more wealthy as a culture because they adopted a lot of the characteristics of their host countries and they contributed to their host countries. Um, these are just four examples. We have uh, Luther Simijian, who uh, was a genocide survivor who ended up on uh, the East Coast here. I, this guy has like 200 patents. You can look at him. He was a crazy inventor. He invented the ATM machine. Citigroup ran it, had it, did like a trial run of it, and then it wasn't popular and let it go. So I, he, was, um, he, was, he was going to go to medical school, ended up at Yale, was planning to go into medical school, ended up getting a, a job in the photography department, and started thinking about how to develop self-focusing cameras. And from that on, became sort of an um, inventor. Let, medical school go by the wayside and became an inventor and had 200 patents. To go in and have 200 patents is accelerated development and progress if there was any. That is work. That is, that is moving. That is forward thinking. Now, I can't get into the psychology of this person, but I can tell you that from what I'm seeing from this sort of pattern of survival is that there is this fervor to catch up to assert who you are as a person, to assert your value. Um, we have Oscar Banker, which is Asaturian, I forgot his last name, Sarafian, Asaturian Sarafian. Um, this guy ended up, uh, about, I think, 15 or 16 years old in the United States, was an aviation um, and uh, automobile engineer, ended up patenting the first working um, automatic transmission that GM eventually took and uh, adopted this for him. And so this guy also uh, adopted, also gave to the, country, to the country that he went to, also produced innovation, also was a genocide survivor. Um, of course, we have Ashid Gorki, who is a very well-known artist. Um, this guy as well uh, survived the genocide, watched his mother die in his arms of starvation, uh, came eventually, ended up here in the United States, and became the father of um, abstract expressionist painting in the United States, and developed uh, a huge following of, of, of admirers. And then finally, I'm going to point to a writer. Um, Zabel Yesan was a Constantinople Armenian. She was educated, very well educated, studied in Paris, author, reporter, um, advocate for women's rights and social justice. She was the only woman to be on the Young Turks list um, of deportation or um, to be killed. So the only woman on the list that was targeted by the Young Turks at the time, which were the ones who were targeting the Armenians and um, perpetrating most of the crimes against Armenians at the time. She happened to be the only one, uh, woman on that list. She went on to, uh, to leave to Paris and then to buy the idea of Soviet Armenia. And she moved back to Armenia under Soviet Armenia and then um, and sort of bought this notion of progress as, as a new Armenian, a new homeland for, for her people. Um, and then finally fell under the, the Stalinist regime because they didn't like thinkers. <laughs> So she, just, she died under, under suspicious circumstances, but we can sort of, uh, I guess, point to uh, Stalin's regimes for her demise. If you're interested in her books, these are some of the books that, that you, can, you can find her writings in these books. She was also a reporter, and she went in and reported on the massacres in various um, areas, on the massacres of, of her people in various areas. So when she came out of, of that atrocity, just like the, the ones before this, when they came out of that atrocity, they were writing fervently, write, reporting fervently, contributing fervently. So my question is, why? I made my assertions, but why? Why were they? Why? Why? They just suffered mass atrocities. We suffer not being able to pay our bills, and we can barely get out of bed like we have depression. They just suffered mass atrocities. We suffer um, social injustices, and we're like paralyzed in so many ways. We get caught up in that social injustice reading it. We're not, we're, this is a very interesting human quality to think about, psychological quality. Why? Why? Why output so much? Why? Hers, you can say, was maybe to document the atrocities she'd seen, but why the others? Why the engineers? Why the scientists? Why innovate? There's a basis. Huh? There's a basis. There's a basis? What drives that? There's a base. Yeah, well, what drives that? What is that? Maybe psychologically it's a way to vent out 
or leave their mark in the history. I would argue you're both right that there is some sort of base, first of all. And I would probably argue that there must be some internal need to leave your mark on history as a people. And every one of the people that we talked about, and you can go find hundreds of people that, of Armenian descent, survivors of genocide, children of survivors of genocide, people born on route from, um, and on route trying to escape uh, Turkey during the genocide, you can go and find out hundreds and hundreds of people who have contributed fervently. It's a very small number in terms of cult, in terms of people. The contributions are extreme. It's not because they're smarter than other people. Armenians don't have anything above other people. We can hold on to our culture. We can say it's this. We could say it's that. But it's it's not. What is it? What is that driver? Is this this need to to implant um, our mark on society? Or was it that this particular group of people already mostly fell into um, places in the diaspora that had the infrastructure ready for progress? I don't have the answer. I'm asking you guys. They may have a lot of anger. Anger? These people yeah. may have a lot of anger. Yeah. Drives them. Anger could be a great driver. But then think about it. Cambodians and Bosnians must have had a lot of anger too. And they didn't. In this case, some personality type, like how much risk taker they are? It could be. That's a good one. Are they a risk taking culture because they were a mercantile culture, so there might be a more of a risk taking culture? That's a very good one. We'd have to look at that. I'd say. The one, with, one place that that may not work is, is Bosnians. The Eastern Europeans as well were risk-taking culture. They had their sort of underground black market. They were sort of the same idea, but they're, they're not progressing. But that's a good one. Somebody else had their hand up. Uh, maybe it's also like their culture. Like, I feel like from what I've seen, they're very like, strict. So because they, like, because they like, suffered through the genocide, they, they try to prove that they're like, worthy of living because they could, like, it's like, they could contribute so much to the world and they could like provide these like great inventions. So it was their way of saying like I'm like I'm human and I'm able like I can live here and I worth. I have worth. That's my argument as well. This I have worth argument. But then then Cambodians too must feel they have worth. And Bosnians too must feel that they had worth. But it's like a different culture too. Like I feel like Armenians have more of a straight culture. Like we're like an example, like I feel like they, like, they get good grades and they like, try to like, exceed them. There is, yeah. It's a conservative culture. Yeah, I think those are good things to look at too. But then this is all, I'm agreeing with all of you, but I couldn't find it because it wasn't true. Because then you have Rwanda. It doesn't have that kind of strictness. It's not a very conservative culture in that sense. And they're doing great. So I'm having a hard time putting my finger on it. I know it has to do with worth. But I'm beginning to think that it has to do with where they fell, the infrastructures in the countries that they fell into. I don't know. I'm working on it. This is a working thesis because it got totally disproven last week. <laughs> was there a difference? I, I don't even know if you looked in, in wealth and just the opportunity to move to the West instead of maybe to somewhere that was less out. Yeah, that's yeah. A lot of the people, a lot of the people who escaped may have had the the means to mis escape a little bit more than the others that didn't. They felt that what was coming and they moved quickly, they saw it. Or maybe they had a chain migration that was maybe already set up a little bit better. What, then what it could have been a factor for them? Yeah, I, that could have been that there was more of the, the means to it. But I, I would assert still with the means or without the means, because some of these, like the, um, the first person that I showed you, he ended up, he was an orphan. He ended up here at 15 by himself. Obviously, he had some sort of, infra some way to get here, right? And so those resources must be, must have some take on my, so I must have some, so it must be a variable. Like there is such a, like she was talking about this sort of strong conservative culture, but also from my observations, the Armenian culture has done so well here because everybody's so supportive of one another and so quick to welcome yeah. new, uh, new ideas. Um, well, new people coming from. Armenia oh, now, yeah. Or clear, the, yeah. The, you know, that there's this very strong infrastructure yeah. here welcoming that more. I, 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 I'm, I'm leaning towards those directions, but I'm still making the argument that it's not any more capable than perhaps the Cambodians, or the Bosnians, for sure. I think for Culturally, the there's like. It was hard to leave. Yeah, those, 
they, the ones that got out were not the were not the educated class. Educated class was completely completely torn apart. But I, so I'm, I I understand those arguments. I'm still sort of leaning towards where they ended up and the infrastructures of the places that they ended up. But I'm not. I don't have. It's not tight yet. We're going to look at Rwanda in a minute, and everything we're saying doesn't uh, doesn't really apply to Rwanda, and they're a great story. Um, so I don't have that one or two variables. But there are. There has to be variables if we think hard enough that makes sense. I feel like something that would apply to like every single one of them would be kind of to inform. I feel like if you write it down and there's actually evidence, not evidence, but as in like if you've experienced it, it's different than like, for example, if you think about it now. It makes you realize it was more real than if someone just tells you about it. I think you're coming to a really good point here. Um, the two cultures that we're looking at that didn't do well, uh, both of them uh, wiped it out of their minds and memories for a very long time. In Bosnia today, you still can't talk about it. Um, you still you can, but you'll have people tell you that it didn't happen. Still, you can. In 2015, we had reporters go in and uh, go and and take pictures and look at the place where they took in 8,000 boys and men and slaughtered them. Um, buildings that have bullet holes all over them. And reporters asked the neighbors and people what happened here. And like, well, I don't know, nothing happened. Um, they had that sort of reaction. So it may be the, the not reading about, not talking about, not learning about. Cambodians were not allowed for two decades. They were under the same rule of the people that slaughtered them. So they were not allowed to read about it, learn about it, think about it. And so I think that that might be something we need to look at because Rwanda itself was allowed. And I think you might have, that might be the direction I will go because that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like also that's how like the denial aspect of it comes, because like the more you deny it, the kind of not that you forget about it, but it kind of becomes like less irrelevant than if you're constantly being reminded about it. It's relevant. Yeah, I think the denial part, maybe the sort of internalizing of devalue might have to do with it, but I think that, that might be the direction. So not any, there are not very specific things that I can hold on to, but that one is a really good one, and I think the structure, the infrastructures of the places they went to. The next place we're going to look at really quick, since we're kind of short on time, we're going to do it really quick, is Rwanda. Rwanda um, suffered, like I said, an atrocious number of, of murders very, very quickly, uh, completely decimated their fabric, uh, their social fabric, uh, but, but they didn't stay silent, they didn't not talk about it, they didn't... Um, they didn't ignore the reality of it. And they, they came up with some initiatives that worked. And Rwanda, if any country is a success story of, of recovery, it's this country. Um, it, it has one of the fastest GDPs, uh, growing GDPs in the world. It's moving so quickly. And its infrastructure has grown so much. And like Cambodia, it is rural, 80% rural. Um, but today, there's um, tens of thousands of, I think, something like 30,000 university students, pre-genocide, there was only 3,000 university students in the country. Uh, today, their infrastructure, their IT infrastructure is unmatchable in the region. They're doing incredible work. So one of the ways that they built, that they did their work, and when you think about their education is actually really good. Uh, they've done really beautiful work in there. They came up with this Uruguido village dialogue, which actually brought in all of the people who were impacted by the genocide from, the, from sort of the outskirts, from the rural areas, and talked to them and asked them, how do we move forward? Um, said, what do we do to, to make ourselves a better country? What is it that you can provide? What is some of the indigenous intellectual capital that we can use? And it, used, it, it created all of these stakeholders in the progress of Rwanda. I, I'm just going to take a quick aside here. The Armenian um, revolution that occurred in the last couple of days created all of these stakeholders in the progress of Armenia. Because the next day, they were out there cleaning the streets and picking up the streets. And everybody on my Facebook had like, OK, I've got this area of the Cascade I'm cleaning. What area are you doing? And it created like ownership and stakeholders in the progress of, and we'll see where, the, where this goes post-revolution. But we're so optimistic because of that notion of stakeholders. And in Rwanda, they kind of did the same. They brought in the people from all over and they said, OK, guys, what do we do? If your ideas are being heard and you have worth and value, what you have to say is important, you're going to take care. You're going to get in there and be like, OK, I contributed. Let's make this work. So the government of Rwanda didn't shut out the um, people on the outskirts. Uh, it consulted with all sectors, including the diaspora, because Rwanda has a very strong diaspora community, including business, um, including 
uh, NGOs, including uh, uh, the UN, including Western ideas and Western thoughts, including aid from them, but stopping short, stopping very short of allowing the Western ideas to set the um, agendas. So one of the things, well, we'll get into that in the next one. So what they got together, they resu this resulted in something called the 2020 Initiative. We're going to get to that right now. They built how they envision, and they put a time frame on it. 2020 is our date. And they built how they envision the, the country to flourish. And this, this flourishing was very heavily based on the development of the technological and scientific sectors. They went in and they decided the only way for this country to flourish is to go through science, technology, research, and innovation. And they worked hard. They put a date on them, 2020, and they worked hard towards that. They incorporated ideas from the outside, but they didn't do um, cookie cutter uh, aid ideas. It's one of the reasons they've been so successful. So aid comes in usually to countries in poverty, kind of developing countries, and usually aid will say, all right guys, here's our initiative. This is what we're going to do. This is what we think, the US, UN, Western powers, whatever it is. This is how, we're going to give you this money, but here's the agenda, and this is what you must follow. And then you have to give reports, and this is how you should do it. It makes a lot of sense because it worked here, guys. Shouldn't it work there? Of course it should. <laughs> Come on, we're successful. Follow our template. Well, Rwanda um, Agami was like, nope, that's a good idea, but we're not using the cookie cutter template because this is its own country. Those are all good ideas. We like your ideas, but this has its own indigenous culture, and we're going to implement the ideas that work for our country. And so he took the ideas and he reworked them for Rwanda and really implemented them. So I'm going to give you two just basic ideas of what Rwanda is doing. One, everyone's getting education. But now look, their genocide ended up with very, very difficult situations for them. Not only were they decimated as, a, as the Tutsis were decimated as a people, the culture was decimated as a culture. The country was decimated, but also one of the weapons of war during this time was rape. And so they also had mass transmission of AIDS, HIV and AIDS, and they had a generation of children who were born with AIDS and HIV. So that, that weapon of war decimated the health sector completely of this country. So let's look at two sort of innovative ways that they're dealing with some of their issues. Um, so these are their sort of four pillars. Knowledge of acquisition and deepening of that knowledge. So not just like knowledge acquisition, what you get in your school, but the deepening of it. And something that they did was really, really important. Not only the creation of knowledge, but the flow of knowledge from like this person here to that person, then from that person to that person, from that village to that village. And they facilitated that by creating a true infrastructure for it and then paying people for the work. Um, so let's look at a couple of their things. So Isoko. Isoko is this innovative idea um, that is developed by the Ministry of Agriculture. Now remember, they're 80% agricultural. So this guy right here, he's being told that he, uh, someone will buy a bushel of corn for a certain amount of, of, of money. And in the past, he would have sold it for that certain amount of money. But today, the Ministry of Agriculture has developed an app where all he has to do is take a, a, a picture of the crop and so to look at the, assess the health of the crop in general um, and look at prices of that crop in real time. So then he can go back and haggle with the person who's trying to buy his crop. This has created a very healthy and, and um, profitable agricultural sector. And we're talking very rural villages away from the capital. The capital looks great, but away from the capital. This is a tangible outcome by that 2020 vision by the government to create tangible change to a country that has suffered tremendously. So this is one of their initiatives. Another thing that they have is this track net. So like I said, um, AIDS was one of the, the, HIV and AIDS became a huge uh, post-genocide repercussion that the country had to deal with, and they still have to deal with that. So they didn't have a way to track um, the records, nor the dispensing of medications for people in the rural areas. So they had practitioners to go out and give the medication and go out and assess health, but they didn't have a way to track it so that it could be completely um, a unified system. So look, they have, they have tons of rural patients that you would think don't have access to to the internet, but they have access to the internet. They are like 80-something uh, percent 
with mobile phones one a lot of them are using solar panels to create generate energy to have a connection with the internet so with these solar panel mobile phones, they're enabling their practitioners to share information from the villages to the center, to the Ministry of Health. Um, these are, they, they sound minor, but these are major. These are big problems that this country had post-genocide that it's dealing with very effectively. It's built a very strong infrastructure and it's heavily, heavily focused on science and technology and innovation and creating an entrepreneurial culture. This is how they've dealt with their genocide and they're doing incredible work. Um, they don't fall under the Western category. They didn't look towards the West. Um, they didn't fall into countries that had infrastructure, but they also didn't negate their past. They also didn't ignore the, the moment, and they took it. So these are the two places that I, that I looked at as sort of success stories in terms of progress and innovation and contribution. Um, today, Rwanda is a model nation to be followed by the rest of, and it's a landlocked nation, and it has no resources, by the way. It has tea and coffee. It has nothing. But it's, it's flourishing. It's figured out a way to do it, and it has had major war, and it has had genocide. So there's a way to do it. Um, so today, there are, like I said, 80% rural, uh, but they're flourishing. Their intellectuals were not mass slaughtered. They were mass slaughtered on a very uh, cultural line. So not everybody was taken. They're a very unique example of that. But uh, if you compare them as a rural culture to Cambodia, Cambodia is far behind just trying to figure out the infrastructure of putting together an IT sector. Barely. And they, Cambodia actually has some resources. So with these sort of four countries in mind, I'd like to just sort of think about what are those variables that we can point to that create a sense of reestablishing worth, create a sense of urgency. Because worth cannot only be reestablished on just scientific and technological innovation. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm looking at it from a wrong lens. Maybe Cambodians that, were, that had this sort of atrocity um, thrust upon them, maybe they did reestablish their worth. And I'm not, I'm not seeing it because I'm looking at a Western end, or Bosnians did, and I'm not seeing that. Maybe them, you know, creating farms and having more children is part of their worth. Did you have a point? Oh, um, I think also depends on how much was destroyed. You know, how, how long was this for? Yeah. yeah. And it, look, it looks like this was recent. Too. It was like 1997. Rwanda? 94. Yeah, 94. Mm -hmm. So, like, probably the, it was like such a. Like you're saying that the, the culture is not, is not accepting. Uh, probably it was like such a big deal that people just want to first focus on them being like healthy and being capable of like. Um, start thinking about the future before they want to like show that they are past that because probably they are not. Yeah. yeah. How do you, how do you so get past it? I think that's the question, question. Yeah. yeah. And it's recent, like what, 12? To yeah, it's not that long. Look at, but you have, and this is where this beautiful example comes in. You have Rwanda and Bosnia around uh, the same times and Rwanda was much rapid uh, like I said, in a very short period of time, um, lots of people were killed and displaced very rapidly. Um, Bosnia took, was part of a, of a war, but Rwanda too was part of a war with the Congo. They were, they were having border wars as well. Their, their factors look very similar. Their outcomes don't look similar. And I would, I, would, I would say, in this case, they had a very healthy government infrastructure being built for them in Rwanda. The government built the, the canvas onto which they can paint sort of success, and Bosnia didn't. And that's probably somewhere we could look at to see where the differences are. Yes? Something you brought up was that uh, with Rwanda, it was it did, <coughs> some, if not uh, most, of the intellectuals survived. Yeah. Maybe, uh, again, it's not something that I'm more familiar with. Maybe that was not the case. In, in any of the other incidents, and um, and then when you end up having that, you're able to use again both Bosnia and Rwanda happened at a time where rapid uh, advancements in technology, and one was able to utilize that, and one was, you know, and one apparently has nothing. Yeah. And so again, you know, you know, sometimes that comes up to leadership, comes you know, comes up to you know, education level of you know of the of the leadership.
Yeah, I think that that's a good place to look. Um, we do have, you can definitely look at the leadership. And you see the leadership of Rwanda, how inclusive it was, how thoughtful it was, and how much foresight it had to sort of bring in all of the stakeholders. And be like, okay guys, we screwed up, let's sit down and figure out all of us how we're gonna move <laughs> forward. Um, Bosnia, the leadership hasn't said they've screwed up. In fact, the leadership has said, what, what genocide? I don't know what you're talking about. Deaths happened, yeah, mistakes were made on both sides. Um, so you, it may be just not reconciling the leadership, not even having the foresight to look to, look to, to, the, truth. to, to the truth and then to rebuilding. I and mean, one of the things you can look at, one of the places you can look at for truth being such a powerful reconciler and propeller forward is Germany. Once Germany was able to really accept the truth and then teach the truth in school, Germany, their economy is doing tremendous. They have like a juggernaut of an economy. Their people are generally happy. They have problems like every country has problems. But that's one example of the truth really propelling that country forward. And then you have other countries where you may look at, for example, Turkey is having a hard time with the truth. Um, their economy obviously isn't doing as well. They're very different spaces. But they're having a very hard time with the truth. They sort of, the truth isn't settled. And their space is very unsettled as well. And that may not be the only reason why Turkey is where it is and it, the turmoil that there is in Turkey, but truth is a powerful recuperator. Yeah. yeah. I think the leadership that you are both talking about is a big um, player in this, because also if you look at both um, Bosnia and Cambodia, mm -hmm. it's that there are still leaders who were part of the problem, or at least like not anymore in Cambodia, but for a long time afterwards, there was leadership who were invested in what happened and wouldn't want to recognize and yeah, move, forward, yeah. move forward. So yeah. that was very that's difficult. A good um, just going off of that, um, Armenians in Turkey that ended up stayed in Turkey were not as innovative as Armenians that had left, correct? And same with the ones that were in the Soviet Union. So again, it comes to leadership, doesn't it? Uh, in that case, it would be like they, they moved to countries that had the infrastructure for prog for progress, for development. Like they, they the opened that allowed them. Yeah, the yeah. Soviet Union wasn't quite yeah. Soviet Union didn't have the infrastructure. Right. I mean, so Soviet Armenians would develop ideas and then the Soviets would shut them down. Like they didn't have that built in. Can you go back one more slide? Uh, one of the things I was, I was looking at this uh, and, uh, before, before we have to, to take off, um, all of your, you know, the disruption, you know, the stress, recalibration, um, variations in accelerated technological, basically or intellectual progress. If you take a look at these things, not in the aggregate with a group of people, but on the individual. If you take a look at someone, and sorry to put some notes, you know, someone who's, who's um, either witnessed or been you know, affected by a suicide, a murder, mm -hmm. molestation, rape, either verbal, physical, or psychological abuse, almost, or not almost, all of these end up being you know, something that ends up happening to them also. Yeah, trauma is the same. Yeah. Right, and yeah. so, so again, you know, what we're doing is just taking, you know, basically taking everything. I mean, you may have brought this up and I, and I missed no, it. No, no, I, I, I think I know what you're um, But, you know, this was something that, you know, that I thought was, you know, um, of, 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 this was something that I was, you know, I, I put for that. And I could see that, you know, um, that this was some more, more basic thing that ends up happening to the way we, the way many people are treated, whether it's in this country or any country. Yeah, trauma is the same. I think that the space is the cycle of, of, of this space is true for trauma in general. Yeah, I think that's a good point. In this case, when we're talking, in this case, I guess what I wanted to sort of look at is that in groups and in cultures and in spaces that have that have suffered genocide. But this will be true for I think all trauma, um, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, sufferers. For absolutely, absolutely, um, guys. Uh, so essentially, I'd like you to leave today. I know our time is up. I'd like you to leave today with sort of the question: What might be the markers, and why are the markers different? What are the variables? And 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 is a sort of space of curiosity. One of the beautiful things about social science and political science and the study of humans and behavior, one of the most beautiful things of that space is that it's gray. It's not black and white. There are not 
fixed answers to a lot of things because we're studying human behavior. We're studying us, humans. We haven't figured out distributions of power and resources well at all, nobody. Maybe Iceland, maybe. But in general, nobody's really figured that out. So this is a very gray area, and sometimes we don't have fixed answers. So. And I don't have the fixed answers for you today. This is going to be, I think, a long um, study forward. Thank you very much for coming. I hope this created questions and curiosities for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.